Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another Recording Fish by podcast. And today I'm joined by Professor John J. Collins. He is a native of Ireland, and he was a professor in Hebrew Bible at the University of Chicago from 1991 until his arrival at Yale Divinity School in 2000. He previously taught at the University of Notre Dame, and he has published widely on the subjects of apocalypticism, wisdom, Hellenistic Judaism, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. His books include the Dead Sea Scrolls, a biography, early Judaism, a comprehensive overview, the commentary on Daniel and the Harmonia series, the scepter and the star, the messiahs of the Dead Sea Scrolls and other ancient literature, apocalypticism and the Dead Sea Scrolls, Jewish wisdom in the Hellenistic age, the apocalyptic imagination, which is the book we're talking about today, between Athens and Jerusalem, Jewish identity and the Hellenistic diaspora, introduction to the Hebrew Bible with C.D. Rom. Does the, Bible, does the Bible justify violence? Jewish cult and Hellenistic culture. Encounters with biblical theology, the Bible after Babel, historical criticism, and a postmodern age, King and Messiah as Son of God, with, uh, with his wife, Adila Yarrow Collins, and beyond the Qumran community. The sectarian movement of the Dead Sea Scrolls. He is co editor of the free volume Encyclopedia of Apocalypticism the Erdman's Dictionary of Early Judaism the, and the Oxford Handbook of the Dead Sea Scrolls and has participated in the editing of the Dead Sea Scrolls. He is general editor of the Yale Anchor Bible series, and he has served as editor of the Journal for the Bible uh, for the Study of Judaism Supplement series, Dead Sea, Scroll, uh, Dead sea Dis Discoveries and Journal of Biblical Literature, and as president of both the Catholic Biblical Associations and the Society of Biblical Literature. He holds an honorary doctor of letters from the University College Dublin and an honorary doctorate of theology from the University of Zurich. And Professor Collins is a fellow of Trumbull College. So welcome to the show. Thank you. All right, let's get right into it. Um, from the earliest times of Jewish apocalypticism, how did the Jews view the apocalypse and did their views vary and change? over the long periods of time of several centuries? Uh, well, you know, in the, uh, what I would consider to be the beginning of uh, Jewish apocalypticism, uh, it probably wasn't really acknowledged as a distinct phenomenon yet at all. Uh, you know, if you look at the book of Daniel, uh, even in the Greek translation and in many Bibles to this day, it's regarded as prophecy. But it's prophecy, if you like, in a new key. It's a different kind of prophecy. Now, possibly even before the book of Daniel was written, um, you had some of the books of Enoch, which give you a somewhat different uh, but related approach. Uh, what's One of the, the things that distinguishes both the books of Enoch and Daniel from older prophecy is greater interest in the heavenly world. And especially important, I would say, is the belief in the judgment of the dead, which was something that was not generally accepted in ancient Israel, but comes into play in the Hellenistic period and uh, plays a very important part in this apocalyptic literature. New scholars have a pretty good idea where, I mean, how this apocalypticism originated. What, what made them believe that there was going to eventually be an end? Well, in the case of the book of Daniel, uh, the end that they are looking for is the end to persecution by Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, this is the, the episode in history that led to the Maccabean revolt. Uh, I think what was really going on was that uh, the people in Jerusalem weren't simply doing what Antiochus wanted them to do, and he wanted to take away their separate identity. But especially, he wanted to shut down the traditional cult. And there was a reaction against that. Now, it's when they talk about the end in the book of Daniel, that is primarily the end that they're talking about. They're not yet talking about the end of the world as such. That develops uh, a bit later. And I think it has something to do, you know, with trends in the Hellenistic world in general. 
that you have more of a sense of a cosmos, more of a sense of the world as being a unit in time and space, and uh, a definite unit, something of which one can envision an end. But I think you don't really get an expectation of an end of this world, an end of the whole physical world, uh, until probably the late, the latter part of the first century of the common era. You probably get it, um, all right, briefly referred to in one of the books of Enoch back in the second century. But it only becomes more or less standard, I would say, in the period after the Jewish revolt against Rome and after the destruction of, um, uh, of the temple in Jerusalem. And for Ezra are clearly dependent on the book of Daniel. It is not apparent to me that either one of them is dependent on the Enoch literature. So, you know, there are different schools of thought, if you like, within the broader cor uh, corpus of apocalypticism. But uh, both 4th Ezra and 2nd uh, Baruch are clearly, I think, dependent on Daniel. In the case of 4th Ezra, you have a, a kind of rewriting of Daniel's vision of the one like a son of man. In 4th uh, Ezra, he's a man who comes up from the sea riding on a cloud, and he is more clearly identified as a messiah. But it's very obviously... Uh, a repeat of the same vision. And in fact, in one passage in 4th Ezra, um, the angel says to Ezra, I've already explained this to, my, to your brother Daniel, but I didn't explain it to him the way I'm explaining it to you. So there was an awareness that they were saying things a little bit differently, but nonetheless, there was that claim of continuity. Second Baruch, I think, was just written in reaction to 4th Ezra, and in many ways, uh, I think, trying to um, to tone down forth Ezra and um, say we can have more confidence in the Torah as being sufficient. But that's another, that's maybe a bit too complicated. When the author of the Book of Daniel is writing, he's feeling the, um, in, the intense situation of the Seleucids occupying Israel. And... Um, what do you think made this person so confident that there would eventually be an end to the persecution that uh, that they're facing? Well, you see, it's the it's the whole prophetic tradition. All of the prophets, pretty much. I mean, all of the prophets that we have wrote in a time of crisis. You know, whether it was the crisis caused by the Assyrians or the Babylonians or or whatever. And nearly all of them are expressing confidence that God will not allow this situation to go on forever. And that there will, well, to begin with, in many cases, they, they find a situation that calls out for divine judgment. And so what God needs to do is intervene to punish people. But there's also pretty much always some kind of restoration. So Daniel stands in that tradition. Now, this presupposes a strong belief, which many people have had throughout history, that our God is more powerful than anybody else's God. And they do generally think of that God as our God. He may be the God of the whole world, but he's always assumed to have a special interest in us. Now, I don't think that is in any way peculiar to Israel. It was maybe more distinctive in the ancient world than later on, but down, you know, to, to the 20th century, uh, people go into battle thinking that God is on their side. And I think Daniel has that kind of faith. So it's a matter of belonging to a certain tradition. Now, not everybody in Jerusalem would have shared that. And I think there was a wide range of responses to that persecution that on the one hand you had some people said that the easy way out of this is give the king what he wants do what he wants and you'll be fine and there were people who said the easiest way out of this is by going to egypt or just getting out of town and there were people like the maccabees 
who said, well, we've got to do something about this. And the author of the book of Daniel doesn't fit in any of those camps. I think the author of the book of Daniel is somebody who says God is going to do something about this. So he was, I suppose we would say, a pietist. You know, he must have been what we would call a very religious person. More so, I would say, than the Maccabees. You know, the Maccabees may have trusted in God also, but they figured you'd better take care of business yourself. Uh, Daniel is at the extreme of that spectrum in, in reliance on divine help. I want to ask about the authorship of Daniel real quick, because Josephus uh, mentions that some copy of the book of Daniel was brought before Alexander the Great when Alexander conquered Jerusalem. And I know that several scholars uh, reject that, but uh, is it at all possible that it could it could be a different book of Daniel that perhaps the version of Daniel we see in the Bible is modeled upon that in some way? I would say no. Hmm. I don't think that is at all possible. I don't know if you're familiar with a scholar named Eric Gruen. Uh, he w worked in classics all his life, taught at Berkeley University of California. And uh, he wrote in one of his books, you know, that Josephus' claim uh, about the encounter between uh, a high priest and Alexander is sheer nonsense. Alexander, we know pretty well where Alexander went, and he did not go to Jerusalem. So this one, I think, is just a legend. We mentioned that the community rule, the war rule, and the Damascus document talk about a reward and punishment after death, but no resurrection. Could you elaborate on that? And do the Dead Sea Scrolls ever mention resurrection? Well, they do mention de resurrection, but uh, first of all, I should say, you know, the, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls are a huge collection of stuff. Uh, the idea that they were the library of Qumran has taken a beating in recent times. Uh, it's much more likely that these were scrolls collected from various places and brought to Qumran to be hidden. Uh, at the time of the, the revolt against Rome. Now, a lot of them seem to have belonged to a sectarian movement represented especially by the community rule, but not all of them. You know, everybody agrees that the biblical books were older than that. The books of Enoch were older than that. And there were other books, you know, that were acceptable to these people, but not necessarily just uh, expressing their specific views. Now, to my knowledge, and I was just, just happened to be working on this yesterday, uh, there are only two of the new texts found at Qumran that talk about resurrection. One of those is known as 4Q Pseudo Ezekiel. Some people would object to that, title and say that it's no more pseudo than a lot of the book of Ezekiel itself. Be that as it may, it is a, a book, you know, a, a rewriting of the prophecy of Ezekiel. And in the course of it, it rewrites the passage about the valley full of dry bones. And the way it does that makes clear, and I think most people agree on this, that it makes clear that it takes the resurrection seriously. In Ezekiel itself, the resurrection was a metaphor for the restoration of Israel. Here, it's the, the resurrection of individuals. The other one is a text that was published under the heading, A Messianic Apocalypse. And it's not actually an apocalypse. It's 4Q521, if you want to play Qumran Bingo. Uh, this is how we designate texts. And that one talks about, well, it's, it starts out saying heaven and earth will obey his Messiah. And then a little bit further on, it says all the wonderful things that God will do, which include healing the sick, uh, raising the dead, and preaching good news to the poor. Now, since God doesn't usually do his own preaching, 
that's usually the work of an envoy. I think it is likely that God would also use an agent in healing the sick and raising the dead. This passage uh, drew a lot of attention because there's a very close parallel to it in the Gospels, in, in Matthew and Luke. But uh, that is a passage that obviously expects resurrection of the dead at the end. Now, Daniel also expects resurrection, but Daniel isn't at all so easy to understand as to what he's thinking of it. It says that all those who sleep in literally the, 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 the ground of dust, Admath Afar. Now, that may be a case of a double reading that you had one manuscript that said that sleep in the ground and another one that says sleep in the dust. Uh, or it may mean in the land of dust, which is actually not the grave, but Sheol. And it says how uh, those will awake, some to, or many of those, I should say, not all of them in Daniel, many of those will awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who rise to everlasting life, some of those, the, the so-called masculine or wise people, will shine like the luminaries of heaven. And that, I think, means they will be elevated up to heaven to join the angelic host. In a lot of antiquity, stars are angels. Now, they don't come back on earth. It is not a resurrection of bodies of flesh and blood. Uh, also in the book of Jubilees, written somewhere in the second century BC, it says their bodies will rest in the earth and their spirits will have much joy. That again seems to envision yeah, you know, what's sometimes called in New Testament studies a spiritual body. Now, you may say that's a contradiction in terms, but it's a, it's a body, you know, made of fine stuff, not flesh and blood. Something, you know, that the way people imagine the stars, you know, to be some kind of burning substance, um, something like that. So I think in the early Enoch literature, that's what you have. That also talks about people being lifted up to the stars. That's what you have in Daniel. Now, you do get some cases of very physical resurrection. The parade example is in 2 Maccabees, chapter 7, where the, the brothers who are being put to death say, oh, that's all right, cut off my arm, I'll get it back in the resurrection. And the other text that's very physical like that is in the, in the Sibylline Oracles, written in Greek. And actually, 2 Maccabees was also written in Greek, probably in the diaspora. So where people used to think the resurrection of the body was very Semitic and immortality of the soul very Greek, our best examples of resurrection of the body actually come from the Greek-speaking world. I think by the time you get to 4th Ezra and 2nd Baruch at the end of the first century of the Common Era, they tend to have try to systematize their thought and work out the differences. And in those cases, you know, you may have a judgment of the dead when they die, but you will still have a resurrection of the body at some point at the end to get that in there too. Now, the Son of Man in these different texts, like uh, Daniel or, or other texts that mention him in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, they portray him a bit differently, don't they? Because sometimes son, they'll even identify the Son of Man like, say, like one of the books Enoch do, like they, they identify him as Enoch, or isn't there some other text mm. that claims that uh, the Son of Man, uh... Uh, can you still hear me? Oops, we're okay. back. Yeah, we're yeah, back. We had a little interruption. Uh, so repeat, can you repeat? You're talking yes. about the son of man figure in Daniel and yeah. who treats him differently. Yeah, how differently do they treat him? Like, is not is he some kind of person that brings about an apocalypse depending on the view? Uh, yes, 
they would say so, already in Daniel. Uh, now, there's a long-standing debate about this, and there has been a long tradition of scholarship that says that the one like a son of man is just Israel personified. But nobody in antiquity read the text that way. All They read it different ways, but he's always an individual. Uh, now, he's one like a human being, one in human likeness, if you like. It's uh, In Daniel, you have a lot of characters who look like animals. This one looks like a human being. And riding on the clouds, the only other figure who rides on the clouds in the Hebrew Bible is the God of Israel. Now, it turns out that before that, we have material from ancient Canaan, from Ugarit, where Baal is the rider of the clouds. And in the Canaanite system, you, this wasn't a problem because El was the high god and Baal was the act of God who kind of runs the world. And there is a good case to be made that in early Israel, and you mentioned this when we were talking beforehand, uh, that in early Israel also, this was the idea. Now, that idea, I think, would have been dormant for a long time before the book of Daniel was written. But it is significant, I think, that what Antiochus Epiphanes did was install the worship of Baal, also known as Zeus Olympias, in the temple in Jerusalem. So that people in Jerusalem, in the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, were quite likely to be familiar with the imagery of Baal. And I think what Daniel was saying was that, no, it's not Baal. In this case, it's a, a figure. In, I think in Daniel, it's most likely the Archangel Michael, who takes that role as, you know, the viceroy, if you like, or if you like, the lesser deity in heaven, not the supreme deity, but not a human being either. So he's, he looks like a human being, but he's something more than that. So that's what I think it is in Daniel. And then at the end of the book of Daniel, it says very explicitly, at that time, Michael will arise. And the idea is that Michael is the one, you know, who comes in and slays the dragon. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the War Scroll, at the end, God will raise up the authority of Michael among the angels or the gods and the authority of Israel among all flesh. Now, by the first century of the Common Era, we begin to get texts that are reinterpreting Daniel 7. Uh, one that's quite controversial is the similitudes of Enoch. This is a section of the book of Enoch that only survives in Ethiopic in medieval manuscripts. And for that reason, some people think you can't trust this as evidence of ancient Judaism. I think, on the other hand, that it is extremely unlikely to be written by a Christian because it has a figure who is called that son of man, who is not clearly identified as Jesus. And in fact, seems to be identified as Enoch at the, at the end of the book. And I don't think any Christian would have written that. So I think this is indeed likely to be a document of early Judaism. That's one. And in that, you know, he's a heavenly figure, that son of man, but he's also the Messiah. And then 4th Ezra, in 4th Ezra chapter 13, Ezra sees this man riding a cloud up out of the sea. And again, he is going to take his stand on Mount Zion and appear very much as a Davidic Messiah, who is being revealed at the end of days. So I would say by the first century of the Common Era, the Son of Man was being identified as a Messiah but not one who would just arise on earth, but who would come from heaven. And then that's the way it's picked up in the New Testament. And I think it was so picked up really after the death of Jesus, when Jesus didn't do what a Messiah was expected to do. And so the belief was that, well, he'll come back and do it right the next time. 
And when he comes back, he, he will come as the Son of Man, riding on the clouds of heaven, as in Daniel 7. And so this elevation of Enoch as the Son of Man, who um, it seems to be that third Enoch, uh, would, it, would it be fair to say that third Enoch is building upon that by saying, okay, so now he's not just the Son of Man, now he's Metatron, the lesser Yahweh. Yeah. But then we have other traditions yeah. saying that Abraham himself is ascended to the heavens like Enoch did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the case of Enoch, I think the identification of Enoch with the Son of Man in the similitudes of Enoch at most comes in in a kind of epilogue at the end of the book. And I don't think it was really integral to the original composition. The main argument for it is that in later tradition, in third Enoch, he does seem to be, he becomes Metatron. Enoch becomes Metatron. And he becomes, if you like, the second power in heaven. And you, you're quite right. You know, Abraham also gets exalted that way in the, um, in the apocalypse of Abraham. Now, many of these texts only survive in strange languages. You know, Slav uh, in Slavonic or Armenian or lang such languages. And they were not, they were pretty much repudiated, I think, by rabbinic Judaism. But they're still very odd from a Christian perspective, too. So I think, you know, they were, they do shed some light on a kind of lost phase of Jewish history. Do you think that they wanted to see Enoch as this, it, I guess, quasi-divine person because they viewed him as, okay, well, God took him up in Genesis, so he must have become mm -hmm. this powerful being? Yes, the whole, uh, I don't know if it's fair to speak of a cult of Enoch. That might be overstating it a bit. But the whole interest in Enoch I think probably goes back to the time of the Babylonian exile because in many ways he resembles some of the characters in the Babylonian legend. The founder of the Guild of Diviners was supposed to have been taken up to heaven and showed all the mysteries of history. And then Enoch gets to do that. And so I think there was some group of Jews, and we don't know much about them at all, who looked on Enoch as our man in heaven, our revealer. And that tradition, you know, persisted down probably to Maccabean times at any rate. And the early books of Enoch, I think, come out of that tradition. Oh, the similitudes probably do too. I think in a lot of that material, you don't hear much at all about the Torah. After all, Enoch was long before Moses. You know, it was a different way of understanding uh, what it meant to be Jewish. Now, I think after the Maccabean revolt, it became much more difficult to have a form of Judaism that wasn't centered on Moses. And gradually then this Enoch tradition fades out and you don't hear much about it anymore. But I think it, it was there. Um, Enoch gets to be imagined as, you see, the, ma the man who was taken up to heaven. And in the Hellenistic period, when the idea begins to take hold that there is life after death other than going down to Sheol, then Enoch becomes an important prototype so that you can hope to be like Enoch, that God will take you too after death to the heavenly court. That's one of the key ingredients, I think, in apocalypticism, is that hope. Are there a lot of similarities between the book of Revelation and the sibling oracles? Because... It's brought up that, okay, well, the sibling oracles talk about um, the second coming of Nero, and the way it talks about Nero in general, not just in that fashion, resembles uh, the way that Revelation talks about Antichrist, and we all know about the 
666 numerological parallel between the two. Yeah. Yes, uh, there are a lot, especially in book five of the Sibylline Oracles. Uh, now, the Sibylline Oracles are that that is a tradition that originates in Egypt. I mean, the Jewish Sibylline Oracles. There were Greek Sibylline Oracles for centuries before that. But the Greek Sibylline oracles were typically very short. And they were typically just pronouncements of disaster on this place or that. Now, somebody in Alexandria, probably in the second century BC, decided to write more developed literary works in the name of the Sibyl. The first ones, I mean, they're a bit like prophecy, and I think this was part of the appeal of the Sibyl, you know, that this, they could write books that sounded like prophecy to Jews, but then were in the name of the Sibyl and written in Greek, and so they might appeal to, to Greeks. Uh, but they were not, the early ones were not what I would call apocalyptic. And when I say that is primarily, they were not expecting a judgment of the dead first case where you get that is the fourth book of Sibylline Oracles, which mentions the eruption of Vesuvius. So towards the end of the first century of the Common Era. The fifth book, which is the one that has most in common with Revelation, interestingly enough, does not have the judgment of the dead, but it has other motifs, and you mentioned one of the key ones, the idea that Nero would come back from the dead. And this is really at the root of the, the tradition about the Antichrist, which had a huge influence in the Middle Ages, and indeed even down to modern times in some circles, in the Left Behind series. Uh, you know, the, the idea of this superhuman evil figure who will come back, you know, who will do everything Christ did except in reverse. And that, to a great degree, they took that from the Sibylline Oracles. And the Sibylline Oracles had taken it from legends about Nero, when people couldn't quite believe that he was really dead and thought he would surely come back. Does Revelation feel like to, to you that it's not just imitating the Sibylline Oracles, but it's also imitating Daniel and all these other texts that we've talked oh, about yeah. throughout the show? And I think in the book of Revelation, you have um, you, you have a very rich tradition. I mean, whoever wrote the book of Revelation was familiar with a lot of literature. And familiar, the, the big book of Daniel is a huge influence. You know, and uh, that's maybe the, the most, the whole idea of the, the second coming that really is rooted in the book of Daniel, of the beast coming out of the sea, the, the dragon, all of that kind of thing is really straight out of Daniel and developed. But then, you know, they throw in other things, you know, the woman clothed with the sun and the, the dragon waiting to devour its, her baby. Uh, that's straight out of Greek mythology. But it's a very rich, imaginative kind of work. And that, I think, is the difference. I don't know if you have had much exposure to what's sometimes called modern apocalypticism. And I'm thinking of things like the Left Behind series. And I think a major difference between the Book of Revelation and that stuff is that the Book of Revelation is highly imaginative. And the modern stuff is highly prosaic. You know, <laughs> it's, not, it's not fun to read in the same way. But uh, yeah, so so the, certainly Revelation wasn't just taking it all from one source. And to sum it all up, do you think that basically um, they would create new apocalyptic stories over time as um, as Judea fell in more uh, despair or was conquered and reconquered over time? They have to create a new apocalyptic think, story to maybe, update it. So, so you froze there again for the yes. Yeah, yeah. I should let uh, you from. You know, yeah, yes, like uh, and I mean, you also get. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. You also. Sorry, we're, we're having a little echo or something there. Uh, okay, but, can you hear uh, me now? 
Yes. Okay, uh, but, good. You, what you said at the beginning was, did they create new apocalyptic stories over time? Sure. Yeah, based, but the full question was, did they create new apocalyptic stories over time to update their eschatology to account for new calamities? I, when they get reconquered by a new enemy and other situations oh, yeah. like that. Now, I mean, the, the, the fourth Ezra is a classic example of that. You know, in, in Daniel, you have this vision of four beasts coming up out of the sea. And the fourth one is rather obviously the Greek kingdom and the, the malicious head of the fourth kingdom is Antiochus Epiphanes. This is not difficult to figure out in the context of Daniel. By the time you get to fourth Ezra and second Baruch, the fourth beast is Rome. Even Josephus hints at that. And so, yeah, this is updating it. And you have to update, you know, in Daniel, you have the, the beast with the with ten horns. Well, you know, you add a few then later on to extend the list. And you don't necessarily identify the early ones the same way that they were identified before. That process goes on right down through the Middle Ages. And you wonder, kind of, you know, how it didn't lose credibility at some point. The other thing that gets updated is the calculation of the end. Now, Daniel is probably the only ancient apocalypse that gives you a number of days or a number of weeks until th these things will be fulfilled. Well, uh, you know, that number then has been calculated and the calculation passed, and it's been redone in every century since, you might say. The last one that I know of was about 10 years ago, with a, a man out in California named Harold Camping, who had calculated that the famous one in the US was the Millerite controversy in the 1840s, when uh, this man named Miller, who was a farmer in Ohio, uh, calculated on the basis of the book of Daniel that the world was going to end. And some of his followers even sold all that they had and went up in a mountain. And then when they realized that the next day was dawning, they wept and wept till day dawned. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, people come back and do it all over again. I suppose hope springs eternal. And one last thing, does it look like to you that these four kingdoms that Daniel's talking about also influenced uh, the book of Revelation? When I talked about the, the four. You know, not so oh, much, right. not so much the four kingdoms as okay. the imagery of the beast. Right. And the beast coming out of the sea. And in, in Revelation, you have one beast that comes out of the sea and one that comes rises on the land. So they play with it that way. You know, and uh the, the, the whore of Babylon is riding a beast. Well, in Daniel, she would have just been a beast. <laughs> but so, you know, they, they play with the imagery, but it's, it, they, they're working with the same imagery. That's, the, that's where it's coming from. Well, I think we can end it there. Thanks for joining me today, Professor John J. Collins. Thank you. Pleasure to talk to you. Yes, yeah, same here. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.